Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor General McCarty, Colonel Darden, for this honor and this privilege. Thank you all the great leaders of South Carolina and the people of this great state. When it comes to mind in my faith tradition in the sacred text, to think about all that we have endured for this year-long process in this pandemic, Psalms 23 and 4 comes to mind. And it reads, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. My brothers and sisters of South Carolina, this pandemic has been a valley. So we have to be honest with ourselves and not foolish and understanding that we have gone through and going through a valley. But this text is showing us and teaching us as we look at camaraderie, unity, and love and respect, as we continue to keep growing to see the value of each other in this great state in which we love and serve and nation, we get to understand in this text that we move from fear to faith, to understand knowing that we are not alone and that we are going through this valley to get to a mountaintop. My fellow South Carolinians, let us pray this time. I'm gonna pray according to my faith tradition and I invite you to pray according to yours. God, our Father, thank you for the men and women who serve our great country in leadership roles and for their families as well. Please provide our leaders with the reminders each day of why they decided to dedicate their lives to public service, not to position and politics. And God, please use that commitment to encourage each and every one of them. Surround them, O oh God, with people from all walks of life and various backgrounds. Allow them to see and continue to see the blessing and the power in diversity and inclusion. We pause for a moment, Father, to ask and lend our sincerest condolences to those families who have lost all these loved ones from the numbers that we're looking at that are stalling from 9,754 deaths as of now and counting in this state in which we love. So we ask for you to keep them, O oh God, tie them up in you and bring them closer to your bosom and allow for us as your children to be there for them. We ask also, God, that you allow for us as we move forth with planning and progress. We ask that you give us the right insight, the right forms that we need to take in moving forward together, united. Please, oh God, let us not forget our state motto, doom, spero, spero, provide, which is Latin, for while I breathe, I hope. As Carolinians, this is a powerful reminder and encouragement that speaks to us today saying that as long as we can breathe, we have hope regardless of the pandemic, we still have power, praise, and a purpose. We thank you, God, for what you have already done for us and what you will continue to do for us because we count it joy and victory right now as we stand forth again together. God, it is in your name that we pray for protection, provision, productive planning, respect, unity, and love. As I conclude, O oh Father, please hear your servant's prayer and keep us, O oh God, like only you know how to. Keep each and every one of us under your arms, under your hands, and your love and your care. Father, we ask that you hear this petition and intercessory prayer on behalf of all my brothers and sisters in this great state as we serve and these great leaders that we are connected to. Hear my prayer, O oh God. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have a number of people uh, here with us. At, uh, Dr. Summer of DHEC will speak in a minute when I'm through. And if you have any questions, we have others, including Rochelle Taylor from the Medical Association, Thornton Kirby with the Hospital Association, Lieutenant Fleming, whom you just heard from, Rebecca Leach represents the Retail Association, Kim Stinson, Emergency Management Division, and General McCarty with the National Guard. And you need to know that uh, when we began this, when the virus arrived uh, strongly in February and March, we put together a team uh, that you will remember is Accelerate SC that had people from all walks of life and fields of of, of service in various positions, medical, educational, retail, everything in between, as well as legislative rep uh, representation. And we formed a plan and we worked the plan. It was very careful. And I, I want to say that uh, it, it, I'm very proud and thankful for the way that the people of South Carolina responded to the virus. I think the plan that we developed uh, very carefully and methodically 
uh, was the right plan. There are other states that took different courses. I think that ours worked better, and I'm very proud and thankful for the way the, the, the people worked. As you were called to combat the virus, the governor of South Carolina has the authority under the law for various emergencies, including health emergencies and disasters, which we usually use for hurricanes and tornadoes, to issue states of emergency, which allows the governor of our state to remove certain regulations or hindrances and issue orders to protect the public safety. Well, that uh, was the first one I issued was on March the 13th, 2020, and that is one year, two months, and 25 days, or 451 days ago. Uh, during that time, it was necessary to issue a total of 39 emergency executive orders, the last of which was issued on May 22nd, 2021, and it expired yesterday on June 6th, uh, and there will not be a 31st executive order. Uh, it is no longer necessary to have a state of emergency, uh, although it is still necessary for us to be smart, to follow the rules, to follow the guidelines, and be very careful as we continue to pull out of the, the virus and its effects. We know a lot more about it now than we did then. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm proud of the way that our, our people responded. As I mentioned, we have a great team in South Carolina. And at the beginning, uh, that was reflected in Accelerate SC with its 30 plus members. And once that plan was organized, we began meeting to, particularly when the vaccine began uh, coming available, to see that it was getting out to everyone that wanted to take the vaccine. And remember, there were, there were some hiccups along the way. One you may remember vividly was when there was an air storm in uh, uh, ice storm in Louisville, Kentucky, and as a result, the planes were on the ground and people all over the country just didn't have access. To, the flow was immediately stopped there for some time. But we worked through that and we had conference calls. I had conference calls with my staff and the governors, other governors around the country from the very beginning. Uh, we uh, spoke at least meetly, weekly. We had weekly meetings uh, in this, this building with the vice president, sometimes uh, President Trump, Vice President Pence, as well as other leaders, General Perner, and all those that were involved. And those have continued uh, with the Biden administration as well. And they are, they, those conference calls are, are continuing, not in the frequency they were then, but are still continuing. But uh, in South Carolina, we, we took the best approach, I think, all things considered, based on what we knew, I think that we got it right. While some other states took the approach of everything needs to be shut down, they just presumed that everything needs to be closed, except for those certain things that were so essential that they should remain open. We took a different approach. Our approach was we don't want to shut down anything unless we know that it is a an activity, a place, a kind of work that lends itself to the spread of the virus. Some states took each of those approaches. We took the latter one, and I think that has made all the difference. We never did shut down in South Carolina. We slowed down, and as a result now, we are on the rebound. We're moving ahead. We're not digging out of the hole that some of our fellow states are in but rather we, we are a blasting off and have great opportunity. So we had a great team, as I mentioned, Accelerate SC, and also lately with the, the great retail uh, help of the Re Retail Association in the person of Rebecca Leach, uh, Thornton Kirby, and all, uh, for the hospital, uh, the hospital Association, and Rochelle Taylor for the Medical Association. Again, we had the whole team on the field. And among, the, among our group, we had insights and understandings into what needed to be done. And the consensus, of course, now is uh, overwhelming that we no longer need those emergency powers, but we need to proceed on the course that we have set out to be careful. We have to we are alert every day, watching carefully what's going on around the world and around the country, and to be sure that the people of South Carolina have good guidance and are safe and healthy and able to take care of their families, take care of their businesses, 
and to prosper. Uh, we issued a number of orders concerning school closures, activating the National Guard, uh, construct critical infrastructure that it was impossible to do with, without the special emergency powers, protection for first responders. We set up a system where resp first responders could call in and get a yes or no whether there was a danger of someone who had had COVID being at a location before they were called in. I think we've had about 8 million calls to, to that system. Uh, it was uh, quite unique at the time. Uh, we had protections for inmates and guards at correctional institutions and safety precautions uh, for businesses, and uh, they, they worked. We required parental consent uh, for a child when we got to the end of the, the danger in the, the schools, which were we knew from the beginning were safer than most places, They're among the safest places, but we, we required that parental consent to, for young children uh, whose parents did not want them to wear or did want them to wear a mask. And we re removed the, uh, state the statewide state of emergencies, uh, the, the, the statewide state of emergencies that some of the local jurisdictions were using as the basis of their restrictions. We, we pull those back. If they wanted to issue something else, they'd have to do it on, on their authority. Uh, some did, uh, most, most did not. But we have worked our way through very well, and again, the time now has come. It is clear that we no longer need that emergency uh, authority statewide in order to, to protect our people. And uh, th there have been some, it, it, it's clear we probably need to clarify the way these states of emergency are issued, and the House and the Senate have come up with the idea that we think is a good one. But I can assure you that during the course of this, and now still as we go forward, we've got the whole team on the field. Everyone is alert. We're a lot more aware of what we're dealing with now than we were at the beginning. And we look forward for, to, to the, the people of South Carolina continuing to prosper and grow uh, in a greater rate than we have before. And a lot of the economic information that is coming in from around the country and around the state is that we're doing very, very well in that regard. Dr. Summer of DHEC. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ed Simmer, uh, agency head for the Department of Health and Environmental Control in South Carolina. It's good to be with you this afternoon. Uh, you know, after 451 days, as the governor has said, I think it is time to lift the emergency order. We certainly are pleased to be at this point. You know, I think if you look at the numbers, we are making great progress in South Carolina. Uh, the number of cases is down. The number of patients hospitalized is down very significantly from January when we were around 1,200 patients in the hospital in South Carolina due to COVID. We're now down around 200. Uh, the number of deaths is dropping, and thankfully, to very low numbers. So we are making progress. Obviously, there is still much more work to be done, and DHAC, working with our many partners, is going to continue to focus on defeating COVID and getting us to the point where we can truly say that we control COVID instead of COVID controlling us. We, ne we will never be able to make COVID-19 completely go away, but I think we will get to the point where it is something that is, uh, we have to be careful with, that we have to monitor, but that for most of our citizens, it will not be a major impact on their lives. And I think that is where we need to go. Uh, we're getting there very quickly. Uh, you know, and I think one of the things I definitely want to note, the governor often tells us that in order to solve any problem, we have to cooperate, collaborate, and communicate. And I think that's really been proven in this, in this response. When you look at the folks who are here, the pharmacies, the hospitals, medical providers, and thousands and thousands of South Carolinians who volunteered their time to help fight COVID. Not to mention all my fellow agency heads. We've worked very closely together. And had we not done that, we would not be here today. So I want to thank all of them for their great support. And most importantly, all the people of South Carolina who've done the right things, worn masks, socially distanced, been vaccinated. Without all of their great work and taking care of each other, as South Carolinians always do, we have a reputation for that for a reason. Um, without taking care of each other, we would not be here today. Again, there is more to do. We still need to take care of each other. There's still lots of folks that need to get vaccinated. And if you haven't been, we have over 900 vaccination sites open across the state. We have ample supply of very safe vaccines. Uh, you know, we've nationwide over 100 and well over 100 million people have been vaccinated with very, very few side effects. 
So if you're kind of on the fence, not sure, please get vaccinated. That's very important as we move forward because there is still the risk that, you know, COVID could come back, could, could come back and, and have more cases if we don't get more folks vaccinated. So please get vaccinated. If you have questions about the vaccine, you're not certain about the vaccine, talk to your medical provider, look at our website, scdhec.gov, look at the cdc.gov website. Uh, lots of good information out there. Get your questions answered and then make the decision that's right for you and your family. But I think in most cases, that's going to be get vaccinated. Um, again, I think we're in, we're in much better shape than we were 450 days ago. That is because of all of the great people who've done so much across the state of South Carolina, certainly tinged with sadness knowing that we've lost almost 10,000 South Carolinians to this terrible disease. But I think you know, their lives will not be in vain if we can move forward from this, we've learned from this, and we'll be more ready next time. So with that, I'll say thank you and turn it back over to the governor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ed Summer. Are there any questions? Yeah, governor, yes, sir. How is this going to impact any federal funding, FEMA funds, anything like this? It will, have, it will have no impact. That's a good question. That is one reason that we continued the states of emergency, because that activated the uh, availability of federal funds. But we are now, we're in the clear. Would yes, you sir. like to comment on that, General? And yes, uh, your soldiers and airmen that are part of the South Carolina National Guard have been supporting this uh, pandemic support now for 451 days. And we have uh, approximately 650 soldiers on duty today. But under a uh, presidential uh, order signed by the President Biden, it allowed the extended use of the National Guard through cooperation with the National Guard Bureau to continue to serve in the capacity that we are here in South Carolina today. So we will uh, see no change in our operation. We will continue to work with the, the agencies and the entities that we have partnered with at this point to uh, ensure that we're prepared to meet their needs. As we have done all along, we will continue to assess the continued need of the, of the National Guard. And as those mission requirements uh, taper off, we will make an orderly transition of our uh, soldiers and airmen back to their civilian jobs. To that effect, we have a a job fair uh, scheduled with uh, Operation uh, Palmetto Employment along with the Chamber on the uh, 24th of June at the uh, Goodwin Building at the State Fairgrounds. So we'll be working to uh, get our soldiers employed back if their jobs were lost while they were been on orders. So we are, we're fully committed to stay in the fight, so to speak, until there's no longer a need. And uh, we're proud to have had the opportunity to serve the governor in the state of South Carolina during this process. Thank you. I'll call on Kim Stinson in a moment, but General, I need, need to comment. Our National Guard is superior, as you know, and has been ranked number one in the country over and over and over. And one time when we were sitting in that room there for several weeks, we had troops in the, the Near East, we had troops in Washington, we had troops out there fighting the virus. We had troops preparing for a hurricane and troops also working on a tornado in the upstate all at the same time. So we've been very busy, but they didn't skip a beat. And it's a really phenomenal performance. And thank you, General, for your leadership and all the guardsmen, all the men and women that support the National Guard. Thank you, sir. Director Stinson, thank you. Right. Thanks, Governor. Uh, yeah, Kim Stenson with State Emergency Management Division. Uh, just want to confirm again what uh, the governor said is that our FEMA funding is not in jeopardy. You do not have to have a state of emergency. And uh, at some point, the uh, uh, FEMA will de determine when the incident period ends. And then after that, uh, we'll have to transition. But right now, there's no indication that uh, that, that uh, incident period is going to end in the near term. So it could, could last for, for weeks or even months later um, on that. So And that covers... Uh, Everything from uh, contract staff to uh, medical supplies to PPE uh, to vaccination operations. So it's pretty much open-ended. Uh, and right now, we're estimating about $415 million of uh, what we think is FEMA eligible at this point. Okay. Thanks, sir. More questions? Thanks, sir. So yes, sir. Uh, looking at the dashboard right now on VHEC on the board right there, it shows that there's only 38% South Carolinians who are fully vaccinated. Um, of course, there's a lot of people still out there that are skeptical about getting vaccinated. So you as the leader of the state, what do you have to say to everyone that is anti-vax or just they don't feel comfortable getting it yet? Well, it's, as, uh, as 
elected officials and others in, in offices. Our, our purpose and, and our, our obligation is to make sure that the facts are known, that the vaccination, that the vaccines are available, that they're easily available, readily available. People know what they are and that they, they have the facts. And ours is not to coerce or to force, but to make it available and let the people of South Carolina make up, uh, make up their minds what they want to do. You've heard Dr. Simmel uh, represent the, the safety of, of those vaccines. And uh, it has been demonstrated uh, that uh, there are some people who, for various reasons, do not want to take the vaccine, or at least they don't want to do it now. And we're not going to force them to do that because we, we should not be forcing anyone to take the vaccine if, if they don't want to. But we are, have done, a, I think, a splendid job in our team of making it available the, the National Guard has not only supported the hospitals and other work in uh, stations, but also has given thousands of vaccines themselves. Uh, we opened up the vaccination uh, for if anyone that is to give the shots. So we, at one time we had over a thousand retail outlets, that is pharmacies all across the state where pe people could go to get the different vaccines, but we were running out of people to give shots. So we used emergency state of emergency to allow you know, young uh, students and others, nurses and people that were not fully uh, yet certified to give the vaccine to be eligible to, to do that. So uh, we here, I believe that we are doing our job very well to see to it that it is available, that the public has access to the information, and then they can make their, their decision. Dr. Simmel, would you like to add? Briefly. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, you know, I think uh, obviously every individual has to decide about the vaccine for themselves. Uh, now that the vaccines are available for children as young as 12 with the Pfizer vaccine, certainly we have a lot of parents bringing their children in to get vaccinated, and I think that's a good sign. Uh, but, you know, uh, people have questions, and they should have questions before they get a, a, something like a new vaccine. So long as they're getting the right information and accurate information, because there's a lot of bad information out there, but if they're getting the accurate information so they can make an informed choice, that's all we ask. Yes, ma'am. Mario? Yeah. As, far, yeah, as, far, as far as the vaccination for children 12 and under, this was a question that we asked like, months ago, maybe last year to DHEC, and I understand it is the legislature's decision, but I'm wondering if there's been any conversations with the legislature about mandating vaccinations for children when they do return to school. Oh, uh, no, we will, not, we will not mandate vaccinations. Would you like to add? Sure. I think it's important to remember, as safe as these vaccines appear to be, they are under emergency use authorization. Um, and therefore, I don't think it's appropriate to mandate any group to get vaccinations, to include school children. Certainly, we encourage it. We, the evidence suggests that it is very safe for them to get it. Um, but again, that has to be the parent's choice. And then also on the federal response, um, we know that the White House has been particularly concerned with the entire South as far as the vaccination rates. Has anyone from the White House reached out about sending any team or anyone else down here from D.C. to help uh, get that effort back? Yes, they have. There's been a recognition since the beginning in a lot of the rural areas that it's difficult to find locations, uh, pharmacies, uh, doctor's offices, or hospitals uh, that were the primary areas of, of vaccination. So there have been clinics that have been stand up, there have been units that have gone out to various places, and there is continuing to be uh, such an effort. Uh, one, one effort that was stood up by the federal authorities uh, was out at the Columbia Place mall and as, as many vaccinations as they were given uh, none i ought to say uh, have come close to what what we did at the darlington raceway and one day we had national guardsmen out there we had had volunteers or hundreds of volunteers and we had i think it was over over 5200 people went through the line in in one day at darlington it was quite some i don't think anyone has, has come close to that but yes there, there are efforts undergoing right now to see to it that those in the rural areas that don't have access to these sorts of institutional locations, that they are, is available to them. Yes, sir. Very good. Okay. You know, I think very importantly, you know, the end of the emergency doesn't mean the end of the effort. So we are still going to be doing lots of things to get vaccine out to areas where they haven't had good access yet. Get them out to our rural areas. You know, try to go door to door to encourage folks where we can. Um, so there's much more work that we're going to be doing. Um, to get more folks vaccinated. Just because the emergency ends doesn't mean the effort does. And I think that's an important point here. Yes, sir. Governor, just for the average person watching at home, we've talked about how all the ways this doesn't impact them 
what changes in the day-to-day -day life of the average South Carolinians will this decision to remove the state of emergency cause? They will see no change by not renewing the state of emergency declaration, which is a two-week by two-week process. They will see no change because the work has been done to prepare us for this moment. Now, the effort, as Dr. Summers said, the effort will continue, but not the state of emergency because the effort, everything that needs to be done at this point can be done without the extra legal authority that a statewide state of emergency gives. And uh, if I may, South Carolina looks fairly open now, walking around the streets, Main tourist district looks 100%, uh, frankly, almost back to normal in pre-pandemic times. How would you describe the current state of the pandemic in South Carolina? I would say it still exists. We still need to be careful. We need to always uh, keep our eyes and ears open for the latest information because we know it is a dangerous virus. If, if, if you get it, uh, you, uh, depending on your condition and other circumstances, you're liable to have some very serious consequences, as we know many of our loved ones did. But we have, uh, the, uh, our posture at this point is very good. The decisions we made not to close all businesses A to Z as they did in other states, and many are still closed in other states. Some churches were closed. It's remarkable what, uh, how far they went in some other states. We took a different approach and wanted, wanted to be careful, measured, and limited as possible, and only to those places and as, as for the period of time necessary that we could justify putting limits on people. So that, that is why we and some other states are in a very good position now to move back into the full thrust of our economic growth, and it is hap it's happening. So no regrets on the response? I, I think, uh, I think we, we uh, did very well in our response, the way we approached it, and particularly, as been noted, the, the team approach in the cooperation, collaboration, and coordination. That's the only way to do something like this. Now, I need to say that in our state, having gone through situations with hurricanes and tornadoes as often as we had, we had a little bit of an advantage in staying organized because we'd already been organized for over and over, and a lot of the people you see right here have been involved. But e even so, the path that we chose was uh, I believe the right one, the better one, and it has proven to be the successful one. Yes, sir. How far are we from reaching herd immunity? And if you never reach that point, what would the future look like? I don't know if anybody knows in this situation exactly where herd immunity is. That would be a combination of the immunity that is given by those who have had the virus and how long that immunity lasts. Uh, it, it probably depends uh, the strength of that immunity, depends on the, the, a lot of physical uh, questions as well as those who've gotten the vaccination, whether it's one, two, or the different types. But I would I would say the the infection rate uh, now is uh, I think is under two percent, two percent. And and the CDC over over time has said anything five percent and under is is uh, very good. Would you like to add, Dr. Sir? So you know I think as the governor said, herd immunity is a hard thing to pin down. You know, I, we've said 70 to 80 percent. Certainly, if we can get to 70 to 80 percent immunity, I think we'll be in a good place. Uh, you know, as, as was mentioned, the vaccination, fully vaccinated rate now for South Carolina is about 38 uh, percent. There are then those who had the disease and recovered. Those folks have immunity for a period of time as well. Since this is a very new disease, we don't know for sure how long either one of those immunities last. We, we believe it's at least a year, but we don't know for sure how long. Um, so we're probably fairly close to herd immunity, and I think the numbers we're seeing indicate that. You know, having said that, we still want more folks to get vaccinated. We still want more folks to be immune because there are still folks getting very sick and dying from COVID-19 in South Carolina. So we have more work to do, but I think we are getting close to the point where the immunity, both from vaccinations and having the disease, is having a marked effect, a marked positive effect on the numbers that we're seeing. And one more question. Yes. Uh, how soon will we start hearing discussions about follow-up shots? So we are definitely looking at that. The federal authorities and many researchers are looking at that. There's no recommendation for booster shots yet at this time. That certainly could come. You know, if it does, we will obviously be very transparent with, our, with the people of South Carolina at DHEC. We will get that word out to folks. We will work with our providers. Some of the same folks you see here who've done such a great job of getting shots out, we'll work with them to get booster shots out. You know, we're certainly 
looking at, you know, there's evidence now that you can probably give COVID with other vaccines. You know, we might well look at doing flu and COVID together if it becomes clear that we need uh, booster shots for COVID to make it as easy for people to do as possible. More questions. Uh, there, there's no limitation against those at this point, but there, there may be special circumstances that can be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Or are there any other restrictions really no, sir. remaining that are being No, sir. We, we haven't had any restrictions on visitation or uh, capacities uh, for about two months now. Those that we've, have, the state of emergency, the purpose from those from then until now has been to assure the availability of the federal resources and other things and also to allow parents to be able to make the decision whether their children wear masks in the, at the young ages in schools and a few other things like that. Last one, topic question, if there is one. Okay, thank you very much.